In 2010, I published a book called Bad Characters, uh, which had the subtitle Sex, Crime, Mutiny, Murder and the Australian Imperial Force. And it was basically a book about the, the dark side of what Australians call the Anzac legend. I wrote it for a number of reasons and at a particular time. Uh, I'd just left the Australian War Memorial, Australia's National Military Museum, where I'd worked for 27 years. And in that time, of course, I'd gained a great deal of knowledge and respect and affection for the Australian part in the Great War. But the more I thought about that, I thought that there was something missing in the way Australians wrote and talked and thought about the, uh, the First World War. And what was missing, I think, was what I would describe uh, as an honesty about it. Uh, as, you, as most people will know, Australia took a very full part in the Great War. Uh, about uh, 320,000 Australians went off as volunteers to serve in the Australian Imperial Force. And of them, one in five was killed and 60,000. They served in Gallipoli, in Sinai and Palestine, and of course on the Western Front uh, from 1916 to 1918. And they certainly uh, maintained a good record. The, the five Australian infantry divisions on the, Great, on the Western Front were regarded as being amongst the British Empire forces best, and I don't think anybody disputes that. But there's another side to the Australian experience of the Great War, especially on the Western Front, and that is that the Australians also had the worst disciplinary record of any co component of the British Empire forces, worse than the British, worse than the New Zealanders, the Canadians, the South Africans. Uh, the Australian disciplinary record was, was terrible. And yet, Australians maintained a very uh, ambivalent attitude towards this. Uh, on the one hand, they were, they were proud of it. They, they were proud of what Australians call the larrikin spirit, the fact that Australians didn't submit to military discipline, that they were casual and independent and they made up their own minds and they, they, they didn't salute officers unless the officers had earned their respect and so on. Um, and yet, the, the, there's something about this, this poor discipline because what's the relationship, I thought, between this, this admittedly terrible military discipline and the Australians' supposedly terrific fighting record? And I thought, there's got to be something in this. Now, the fact is, almost nobody in Australia had previously looked at this. Uh, there was a, an MA thesis done about 30 years ago on the death penalty because Australians, although they were sentenced to death, uh, in fact, weren't subject to the death penalty. No Australians were actually executed, except for crimes. Uh, but they weren't executed for uh, what New Zealanders and, and the British, British soldiers were, for ca supposed cowardice and for uh, insubordination and so on. Um, so I, I wanted to look at the, 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 this previously unexplored, but very important part of Australia's military experience of the Great War. And it, it gave me many surprises. I mean, the first thing is, is that it was actually quite easy to find sources on this because lots of Australians wrote uh, letters and diaries and memoirs. Uh, many of those sources were deposited either in state institutions, state libraries, and overwhelmingly in the Australian War Memorial where I used to work. Uh, there are, of course, abundant official records of, of indiscipline. There's, there's lots of um, court-martial files that are now freely available. Uh, there are many, of course, uh, unit records, unit histories, and so on. So the, there was no problem actually finding what this story was. I mean, the weird thing was that nobody seemed to have, have had told that story before. But as I say, the thing I was very interested in was the relationship between this admitted uh, poor military discipline, and I'll talk about why it was poor in a second, uh, and, and the Australians' fighting prowess. The reason that, that Australians had poor discipline was partly because they never regarded themselves as a regular force. If you think of the British Army, it had various components. Uh, it was obviously based on a core of a, a regular army, and to that were added the, the Territorial Army and the New Army. And even though Britain uh, acquired a large number of conscripts in the course of the war, it was basically imbued as a regular force, and the standard of discipline, of subordination, of obedience, of turnout, of drill, was based on that of the regular army. The, Australia had none of that because Australia's military forces before the Great War were basically citizen forces and the Australian Imperial Force remained a, a, a self-consciously citizen force throughout the war. So even though many of its officers were either regulars or were skilled amateurs, they never succeeded in imbuing it with that regular discipline that you find in the British Army. So Australians uh, regarded themselves as what Shakespeare called warriors for the working day. They would do what they had to do, they would obey the orders they were given, mostly, 
but they wouldn't submit to irritations like saluting. So right through the war, Australian senior officers are first of all insisting and then imploring and then regretting the fact that their men don't salute. So at the end of the war, John Monash, the commander of the Australian Corps, is embarrassed because his men simply don't uh, render those sort of courtesies. And increasingly, as the war goes on, Australians, they don't become more soldierly. If you like, they become less soldierly. Uh, but they never stop being good fighters. So there's the paradox of the AIF. And the paradox really becomes pointed in 1918, because in 1918, the AIF, which remember is composed exclusively of volunteers, its numbers are declining because of battle casualties and the fact that there are no more volunteers coming forward. You know, the, the, the graph of, of voluntary recruitment in Australia is just a, a, a jagged line that goes down and down and down. So from about the, the end of 1917, that's the, the, the AIF. It has to fight with what it's got and it's losing. I mean, it loses as many men as casualties in 1918 as it does in the terrible battles on the Somme in 1916. So uh, at this, in 1918, it's, it's losing strength in, in men to manpower terms. It's gaining in strength in armaments. You know, they're, they're increasing the number of Lewis guns. Um, it's increased in its, its sheer professionalism in the sense that it's been a proficient fighters, but its numbers are going down. And the other thing that's happened in 1918 is, is that its desertion, its absence and desertion rates are going up. That the Australian uh, absence rates are always greater than any other force on the Western Front, any British Empire force. And as the war goes on, those rates increase. So I've forgotten the exact figures because I don't do numbers, but it, there are twice as many Australians going deserting in, or going absent in 1916. There are about eight times more in 1918. Uh, now, here's the paradox. What's the one word that you associate with the Australian Imperial Force in the Great War? Well, that word is mateship. It's, it's a word which, which connotes the, the, the universe of male bonding that kept that force in being, that kept its men fighting, fighting not, not for some abstract cause or for king and country, but for each other, for their mates. And yet, what is the one thing that they're doing more of in 1918? It's abandoning their mates. Men are, are they're not necessarily deserting for good, although there were men who nicked off for good, who lived behind the lines as, as uh, marauders and raiders and robbers, even murderers. Um, but many of them are just going off for a break. They decide that they've had enough and they nick off for a week or two weeks or a month and eventually they either get caught or they literally come back and say, we've had our holiday and we'll come back. Now, how does that square with the idea of mateship? And I have to say, it was, it, it's something that took me by surprise and as I say, it's something that no, no, no Australians have actually really pondered, this paradox that the force which is based by, on mateship and bound by mateship is also the one which uh, can least retain its men in the front line. Now, in, in the British Army, what kept men in the front line? Well, probably the same thing, because what Australians call mateship, British troops call comradeship. It's that identity with their regiment, perhaps, their cause, certainly with each other. Uh, and, and in Britain, in, in the BEF, that force kept that, that army in being, even through the, the terrible battles of 1916 and 17, and through the year of victory, which, as we know, was very costly. The Australians are, are different because they're able to reconcile or to maintain at the very same moment this sort of two contradictory ideas. One is that we're mates, and the other is that we'll nick off when it suits us. Uh, and that was the, the thing that I, I grappled with and, and I think I came to terms with. I mentioned the death penalty. Uh, the reason that Australia didn't in, ratify any death penalty is about 120 Australians were sentenced to death, mostly for things like cowardice and desertion through the war. None of those sentences were ratified because the Australian Prime Minister, Billy Hughes, for the second half of the war, didn't want to uh, impinge on or diminish recruiting. He, wanted, he didn't want men to think that they would volunteer and then be shot for doing something wrong. And so no Australians were executed uh, for military crimes. Uh, so we've got this paradox. Um, I should also mention just finally the, the reaction I got. I expected that bad characters would uh, get a bad reaction because Australians were very proud of their Anzac heritage and would resent the way they were being criticised. Uh, and what I discovered actually was that a lot of Australians, uh, I, I expected the book to be burned in the streets. I thought people would buy it just to burn it because it was heretical. And it turned out that it wasn't heretical. It actually, I got lots, lots of letters from people telling me that, that their gr grandfather's experience chimed in with the story I was telling. Their grandfather had in fact gone absent but he'd also been decorated. You know, the idea that the AIF, some were heroes, some were criminals, and some were both. 
Um, so in the end, what I discovered was, was that Australians are quite prepared to learn the truth about their First World War experience. The book went on to win the Australian, or jointly win the Australian Prime Minister's Prize for History for 2011, so somebody must have thought it was worthwhile. And as I say, it's not been burned by people, it doesn't sell very many copies, but I get lots of letters and emails from people telling me that this is a story that they're glad that they now know, and they're surprised that it hadn't been told before. So, that's bad characters, sex, crime, mutiny, murder, and the Australian Imperial Force. Thanks. If you want to find the private, I know where he is. I know where he is. I know where he is. If you want to find the private, I know where he is. He's hanging on the old barbed wire.